Okay, well, I appreciate everybody who is here. Um, okay, CRISPR. So CRISPR stands for uh, clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Is that something trying to get in? No. Okay. So originally, when CRISPR was uh, discovered. Let me, draw, let me draw kind of like what this genetic structure kind of looked like. Let's see. Okay. So CRISPR is actually an uh, immune system in bacteria. What was originally, how it was originally discovered is there was a researcher named Francisco Mojica. He was looking at genomes of bacteria and he found uh, these repeats. Okay, so um, he found these sections of repeats. So the way that he would find these is if you're, if, if you're looking through genomes, uh, sometimes you'll do perhaps like a sequencing reaction of a genome, and you'll get uh, you get what are called reads. So imagine these are like these are reads from next generation sequencing. That means a read is like you get uh, a piece of data that starts here, and this is a string of DNA sequence uh, that's a string up until the end, and that's one read. And oftentimes genomes are assembled by overlapping, finding overlapping regions in these reads and then you stitch these together to form genome assemblies. Okay. When you find repeats, if you find repeats in a genome, how would the read data change? Like if there, if there was a, so a repeat is a section that of, of a string of DNA, so some sequence of DNA that is repeating in the genome. What, what, would, what would you see in sort of like um, read data of repeats? Any ideas? Yes, yes. So you'd get essentially like what's called like a read pileup, where if, if you saw something like this in your data where you have like a ton of sequence copies of whatever this thing is right here, that, that would be an indication that you have discovered like a repeat. Okay, so that's one way you can identify reads bioinformatically. So when you're looking through these sequencing data, oftentimes you'll find sequences where all of a sudden there's a huge pileup of reads. That indicates that there's a repeat. Another way to find repeats is you might take, you might take some section, need erase. That's one way to sort of like identify repeats. Another way to identify repeats is perhaps you're looking at a whole genome and maybe there's some piece of the genome that like strikes your interest. So you take that sequence of the genome and then you run a blast basic local alignment search um, tool. tool. I always think algorithm, because it is an algorithm, but tool, thank you. Uh, you'll run a blast, so maybe you were very interested in whatever this thing was, okay? And you run a blast against some particular organism X. And if you get alignments for like 100 hits within that organism, that would indicate that that is a repeat sequence, right? So these are just kind of different ways that you can detect repeats. So there was this researcher who was studying these repeats in bacterial genomes, and he started to get really interested in these repeats that he found, okay? And when he would look in between these repeats, when he would look in between these repeats, um, so if this, if you would blast this sequence, this this diamond symbol sequence, that that's the repeat. But then in between the repeat sequences, if you would run a blast of what was in between them, you would get hits against viruses. So maybe this is a hit against virus one, and this would be a little section against virus two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this guy discovered this kind of bizarre region of genomic DNA that had this pileup of repeats. And in between each repeat was small sequence homology to viruses. Okay, so that's where clustered 
regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. That's where the name CRISPR comes from. It comes from this region of genomic DNA. Okay, so then what would you think that this is for? If this is in a microbial genome, what would your hypothesis be? Uh, maybe it's like recombining or something? It's definitely recombining, so, so, so that's correct. So actually some of these genes, so this is kind of like a larger genetic circuit, and some of these genes are actually the genes that are encoding the functionality that captures viral sequences and recombines it in between these clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. So yes, you would think recombination, but why would a micro want to recombine a virus genome into its genome? Why would it want to do that, these little chunks? Yes. So that's correct. So this is a mechanism of resistance against these viruses, okay? So what, essentially what the bacteria has learned to do is it's capturing little chunks of virus DNA and it's incorporating it into its genome into a system that can attack those virus genomes, okay? So what you wanna remember about CRISPR is not only this, but it, the, the wild type functionality of it is uh, bacterial immunity. Okay, so now we'll go through some of the pieces of the system. Not all the pieces, but some of the pieces, some of the key pieces. Okay, so there's essentially um, three to four like key pieces. Okay, so one is um, Cas9. So one of these genes is called Cas9, this is the name of the gene. Cas9 codes for messenger RNA, it gets translated into a protein called Cas9, okay? And Cas9 is a nuclease. It's a endonuclease, okay? So remember, there's exonucleases that cut on the outside and endonucleases cut in the inside of a DNA molecule creating what's called a DSB, which stands for what? Double say break. Double stranded. Double stranded break. Okay, so that's one key piece of the system is a Cas9 gene, which is a nuclease, an endonuclease that causes double stranded breaks. Okay. So a second key piece of the system is what's called the tracer RNA, okay? So the tracer RNA, if you have the, if you have the Cas9 nuclease, the Cas9 nuclease can be sent to uh, a specific spot where to cut. In order to guide, uh, provide the guiding function, there's this molecule called the tracer RNA, which binds to, let's give it a color. We'll make it red. Okay, so the tracer RNA essentially binds to the Cas9, okay? And it's an intermediary between the third component, which is the CRISPR RNA, okay? Guess where the CRISPR RNA comes from? So one of these pieces, again, like don't take this order, this is not like a canonical order, but one of these genes is coding the tracer RNA, okay? Guess where the CRISPR RNA comes from? Knowing that this is what CRISPR means and that this is the CRISPR section, guess where the CRISPR RNA comes from? Virus. Yeah, it comes from these little chunks of these viruses, okay? So let's say we had a blue chunk say virus three. Okay, so the CRISPR RNA binds to the tracer RNA to form this, um, this has a name, it's called the RNP, which stands for ribonucleoprotein complex. So it's a ribonucleo, because it's got RNA, 
both the tracer RNA and the CRISPR RNA are an RNA, and it's a protein because it's got Cas9. So it's a complex of RNA and protein bound together. These three pieces come together and they form this machine. Okay, and the three pieces have different functional roles. So the Cas9's functional role is to cut DNA. The tracer RNA's role is to bind the Cas9 to the CRISPR RNA. So it's the intermediary. And then the CRISPR RNA, its function is to essentially be a guide telling where the nuclease should cut. And because this is RNA, which is typically how many strands? One. One stranded. So there's exposed hydrogen bonds, okay? That are looking for something to bind to, to anneal to. And they're gonna find a sequence to bind to that they match with. So kind of similar to like fish in that you have probes in fish, nu uh, nucleic acid probes that intercalate and find spot. That's similar to what's happening with the guide RNA. Essentially like the Cas9 is kind of like coming onto the DNA and wherever the guide is recognizing a spot that matches, that's where it will cut. So according to this, what would get cut by this system with this guide, with this CRISPR RNA? Which virus, number one, two, or three? Mm. Yes. So you can see how this is a very adaptable immunity system where anytime you get infected, the bacteria gets infected with a new virus, this system can capture little sequences of that virus genome. It can incorporate it through recombinations into in between these clustered repeats. And some of these repeats get transcribed as CRISPR RNA and so if this virus, the virus three that had a longer genome, if that virus ever tried to reinfect this cell, it could be targeted by this nuclease and its genome would just be chopped up. So it's a protection mechanism against the virus. Okay, does that, does that make sense? This is the basic CRISPR system. And all three of those molecules together were called what? The RNP, ribonucleoprotein complex. Yes, good question. Okay, so um, so this is the wild type system. Um, and the person, uh, the, uh, lots of people have worked on this over the years and kind of characterized the system, but one of the people who won the Nobel Prize for sort of originally characterizing and learning how to originally engineer the system was Jennifer Doudna um, and another person named Charpentier. Uh, so, okay, knowing this, how might you engineer this to cut any sequence you want? What piece would you need to change? The guide. Yes. Well, well, okay, so yeah, so the guide, but use the actual term. CRISPR RNA. The CRISPR RNA, because guide RNA actually means something very specific, which we're just about to define. So in order to engineer this, to use it as a biotechnological tool, you have to modify or change the CRISPR RNA. So some of the original early work discovered that the, if you just, if you just, you can make your own guides, you can make your own CRISPR RNA, you can put like your favorite gene X sequence. So if you put a sequence for gene X into the CRISPR RNA, then what it's gonna cut is it's gonna find your gene X sequence and it's gonna cut that and induce a double strand of break, okay? And then some of the early engineering figured out that there isn't, if, if you're engineering this as a biotechnological tool, there isn't really a benefit to having these two components separate. So they created what's called the guide RNA. Or gRNA. The guide RNA is just an innate fusion of the tracer RNA. plus the sequence that you want to target, which is in theory like the CRISPR RNA of your choice. So if you fuse these two together, that's what they did, they fuse these two together to create just one component, then that's called the guide. So I guess the more proper way to draw this, if it's being used as like the tool of biotech, not biotech 
is just a two component system where you have the guide RNA, which is still doing the exact same thing as the tracer RNA plus the CRISPR RNA because it's fused, and then the Cas9. So the biotech um, usages of this have reduced the complexity of the system to make it just two components, but it's still essentially like the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay, that's okay. Okay, um, so what do you do with this? Let's clear up some space. Okay, so what do you do with this? So let's list uses. So one, you can do double-stranded breaks. Why, why would a double-stranded break be useful? Like, what would you use that for? Yes. So the most sort of like first intuitive usage of CRISPR might be like knockouts, where you're excising chunks. Um, okay. Before we go into more uses, let's go through now what happens when you actually get a double-stranded break. So in any cell, try to get a better, this one better. In any cell, there we go. If you have DNA, and if the DNA, it's it's actually pretty common to get a double-stranded break. You can get double-stranded break just by um, wear and tear. So if you get a double stranded break, what will happen, or I should say, if you get, if you had many, many, many double stranded breaks, what would happen to the cell? Die. The cell would die. Like this is sort of something that hurts the cell. The cell does not want its DNA to be cut up. Okay. So what naturally happens, do you think, in a cell when there is a double stranded break? They repair. They repair it. So there's two mechanisms of repair. Okay. There's one that's called blunt repair. Or this is also, this has two names. One name is blunt repair, another name is non homologous end joining. Or if you read the CRISPR literature, it'll say N H E J. So this is a kind of a common acronym for non homologous end joining, which means the same thing as blunt repair. The other one is called HDR, which is homology directed repair. This we have extensively covered a lot. This is just a fancy name for guess what? Homologous recombination. Okay, so we've talked a lot about recombination, like using it as a tool. It's actually a natural repair pathway in cells. So we have two repair pathways, blunt repair and homologous recombination. So in this case, what happens is if there's a double strand of break, the cell can just take these two ends and it just kind of smashes them together. So it'll just take this piece and shift it over and kind of smash it together. Okay. This is uh, nice in a sense that it's kind of like, it's kind of like quick and easy. It's kind of like a quick and easy fix. But what might be the problem with blunt end repair? It's not um, gentle. I don't really know the word for it. I know, it's kind of gentle, I guess. I mean, what, what, what's the conundrum that the, cell, that the cell faces? Is anytime a cell, and it, I mean, a cell can't think, but it's programmed sort of to think. And so if a cell encounters a stimulus of a double strand of break, what is the conundrum right here at this spot? What does the cell like not know about this break? If they're attaching to where it actually broke off from instead of some another random break in there? Yeah, you don't really know what, how, you don't know, if you see a double strand of break, you don't know how much information was lost and you don't know if these two pieces should actually just go together. Because there's another double-stranded break, like if you had two double-stranded breaks, something like this, and you lost that little chunk, and then you did blunt end repair, now you've created a frame shift that will destroy whatever that sequence was. 
So this is the conundrum that the cell sort of like doesn't quite understand every time it encounters a double strand break is it doesn't quite know if blunt and repair is really like the correct way to fix it. So blunt and repair is kind of like a quick and easy way that like it'll get the DNA back together, but the result of that might be something real bad. You might have like a mutation, you might have a deletion, you might have a frame shift mutation. Real bad things can happen after blunt repair. So there is another repair pathway, homology directed repair, okay, which is kind of like the, um, you might say this is the more, I guess maybe like the more high fidelity repair. It's more accurate. And why is it more accurate? So homology directed repair, homologous recombination always relies on what? Is it the torsos? Yes, which implies there are how many copies of the DNA? Multiple. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you can only do homologous recombination if there's multiple copies. So if there was a second copy of whatever this was, then homology directed repair would be by far the superior method to repair because the cell would kind of look up here and it would say, well, this is an exact copy. So I know I can repair based off this with homologous recombination. And so then you would get your like holiday junction, they would intercalate and then you get repair, which essentially just recorrects what it was originally. But the downside of this is that you need at least two copies. <coughs> And sometimes cells don't have two copies, especially if it's like a bacterial cell that's haploid, you might need to do blunt repair, okay? So know that there are these two pathways and CRISPR is gonna initiate one or the other of these pathways, depending on uh, multiple things, including like the type of cell, the ploy of the cell, and also what you're providing the, the input into the cell. Okay, so, now let's talk about these uses. So a knockoff. So let's say you, let's say this is gene X and you wanna create a knockout gene X using CRISPR-Cas9. This is probably the simplest, the most simple usage case. Okay? If you were doing it the most simple way, you would just, you would just make guide RNA that targets gene X. Okay, so then you're gonna have a Cas9 with a guide that matches your gene X. It'll come here and it'll cut it, okay? Now it can, let's say, let's say it goes to blunt repair. Let's say it goes to blunt repair and let's think through like the options of the things that can happen when you're trying to construct this knockout. So option one, option one, what could happen is the cell could just do blunt end repair immediately and perhaps it perfectly refixes the gene. So option one that could happen when you're trying to construct this knockout is you could get perfect repair. And so essentially that would be like a failure to construct your knockout, okay? Option two is CRISPR makes the cut and some little chunk perhaps is lost or a little tiny fragment is broken, okay? And then it does the blunt repair and you, what, after it repairs, you're missing a little section. If that's the case, then you've caused a frame shift. And so you could get, you could get a knockout via frame shift or option three, you could get a, um, you could have, you could still have like a functional mute. So depending on where the break was, like for example, let's say the break was right here. Let's say there was a break right here and you repaired it and you lost like a little, you lost a little snip or you lost a little T or an A or whatever, one little base. 
So you'd have a little frame shift here on the C terminus of the protein, but perhaps the key functionality of the gene is actually encoded up here on the N terminus. That would not technically be like a complete knockoff. Does that make sense? Because you'd still have the majority functionality intact on the N terminus of the gene, okay? So that could be, you could have potentially like a functional mutant. That would be another option. So what I'm trying to teach you is that in the more simple usage cases of CRISPR, you don't have a guaranteed outcome of what you're gonna get. So it sounds nice, like genome editing sounds real nice, like editing makes implies that you can get exactly what you want. That's actually probably a misnomer in that when you do CRISPR, you do not guarantee which of these happens. You do it and then you have to figure out what happened and then if you got lucky, maybe you got the one that you wanted. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. But there's ways to uh, tweak the system and make it a little bit more complex and a little bit more specific. So for example, let's still go on the line of the knockout, but let's make it more efficient. How could you make the knockout more efficient? So we want to do, let's say we want to do a complete knockout. Like we want to get rid of the entire ORF. How would we do that? Take away the binding. So you're saying make the guide RNA target the start codon. So you could, you could one, you could, you could strategically, um, strategically target like key regions. That could be good. But there's, a, there's an even better thing that you can do. Keep, keep thinking, keep thinking creatively. Like what, what else could we do to make the knockout even more efficient even than that? Because even in this, you're targeting a key region, but you still don't know what, which of these is gonna happen. How could you kind of guarantee that you would get a knockout? <laughs> yes, okay, so that's, an, that's a better idea. Is, uh, this is called multiplexing multiplex guides. So if instead of having one guide, you have two guides or three guides. And let's say, let's say you target, let's say we do three and we're gonna have one guide target right here. We'll call this one. We'll have a second guide target here and we'll have a third guide target here, okay? Now when this happens, you're gonna get a cut here, a cut here, and a cut here. Now we have three cuts. It's really been chopped up. It's really been mangled. And so blunt and repair, nine times out of 10, is not gonna be able to fix this. Like it's gonna, it's gonna, something wacky is gonna happen. And so you're much more likely to get a blunt and repair that now has like a major deletion if you're multiplexing guides. Okay, so. This would be like option four, um, complete knockout. If you've designed the guides properly and you do multiplexing. Okay, so that, that's an example of the first usage case of CRISPR is you can do targeted knockouts in a site-specific spot of the genome, targeting the gene that you want to create a knockout. So that's an important thing. But that is not necessarily uh, genome editing per se, because editing, again, implies that you're able to take a sequence and actually change it to exactly like what you want it to be. This is more just like targeted genome disruption. Okay, so CRISPR is good at like targeted genome disruption. So then let's go to the second usage case, which would be genome editing. Okay, so if this one relies on Let's say this one relies typically on uh, non-homologous end joining. That means that genome editing probably relies on the more fi uh, high fidelity repair mechanism. So this one relies on homology directed repair or homologous recombination. Okay, so let's talk about this one. So let's say you want to do a genome edit or you want to do uh, an insertion of some sequence into the genome. So here's a unique method where if you have a chromosome, 
and you have gene X on that chromosome, you can actually target and do an insertion via CRISPR genome editing if you can force homology directed repair. I have to erase this to get more room to show how this works. Okay, so let's think through what we need to happen. Okay, so one, we need the Cas9. Two, we need a guide RNA that targets gene X. So we have Cas9 guide that's gonna target that. It's gonna deliver a cut, okay? And if we wanna do, this is in the context of an insertion, or a gene edit. What now do we need to provide in addition to these components? So there's a third component that we need to provide in order to get a successful insertion or edit of this spot to exactly the sequence that we want. What could we provide? Would it be like the insertion sequence with some homology it recognizes? Yes. How would you deliver that? So you're right. So, so so let's say let's say we wanted to let's give it let's give a very specific example. Let's say we want to create on that chromosome a gene X that has an N-terminal um, GFP tag. So in the genome of whatever this creature is, we want to insert a GFP tag tagged to that gene. So you're saying this is what we would want to deliver. How would you deliver this? What would it actually be a part of? Do you need like recognition sites on both sides? So you probably need, yeah, okay. So let's say, let, let's do like homology region one, gene X, the whole gene X is probably like homology region two. So we have homology here, we have homology here. This would come from here, okay? So we got that. How do we deliver this into the cell? Like what's the term of the actual thing that I'm delivering into the cell. In addition to the Cas9 and the guide RNA. To get homology directed repair requires that you have how many copies of this thing? Multiple. multiple copies. How do you get multiple copies of a genetic sequence in a cell? You know? Multiple copies of a sequence in a cell? Replication. Yeah, so what are things that replicate to high copy number? E. Plasmid? Yes, a plasmid. So again, so, so all you'd have to do is you build a plasmid. You build a plasmid that is compatible with this organism that has this sequence built in, okay? And so number three, the third reagent you would uh, give or deliver to the cell is a plasmid. Then when it makes a cut, when it's deciding, do I do blunt end repair or homology director repair? If there's a high copy plasmid with 600 copies of this thing, it's gonna immediately find its uh, source of recombination. And then it can <coughs> do a recombination. And then what will get filled in, in this section, is exactly what was on the plasmid, which is your GFP, Gene X. Okay? And so now on the chromosome, you have a perfect insertion of whatever was on that plasmid. So this is actually how you would actually get quote unquote genome editing, is you have to modify the bolus of what you're providing to the cell by including a template. This is called a template. Sometimes you call this a repair template, but it's essentially just like a plasmid. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's one scenario where you would want to do an insertion. What if you wanted to do a mutation? Let's say you wanted to, let's, let's, let's game this out, like it's worth thinking it through. Um, let's say you want to do gene X, but you want to make a very specific mutant of gene X. Let's say we want to make something like K295 allen. We want to mutate this lysine at 295 position to an alanine. 
how would you get that? This would actually be a quote unquote an edit. How would you get that? What would we have to do? None of this changes in that you're still gonna require you're still gonna it's still gonna require a plasmid with gene X. But now think about like the toolkit of the things that I've taught you. How could you get this? Like what, what would you build? How would you have to modify the plasma? So this is the desired effect that we want to appear in the genome. So how would we modify the plasma? Think back to the module on DNA modifications. less people here so there's less brain power <laughs> and it's Friday. to think through the questions and it's Friday like think through okay look like think through like one of the things that I really try to emphasize in this class very early on is the importance of plasmids because everything in biotechnology revolves around your ability to construct plasmids and I taught you a very specific methodology that was allowed you to make specific mutations on plasmids what was that called? Yes. Okay. So all you'd have to do is step one, uh, you'd build this plasmid and you could build this plasmid by just cloning the gene into a plasmid with standard restriction enzyme cloning. And then step two, it would be site directed mutagenesis. So you design your primers, right? Remember a PCR is all the way around. You select for that mutation with the DPN1, you recover it, you sequence it. And then now you have a plasmid that is K295 amine. Okay, so you understand now how you can actually make this in the lab. You can synthesize this and make this in the lab. And then when you provide that plasmid into the cell and it does its cut, now it's gonna repair off this. And then once it repairs off this, that edit will get incorporated into the genome. And then there you have it. Does that make sense? So that would be actually a pipeline of how you would actually produce a, an edit, quote unquote edit. Okay. Do you ever run into problems by adding those, I guess, base pairs and inserting it into the organism's genome? Does it ever throw other parts of the genome off? Yeah. Okay, so anytime you're doing a change, it's no longer wild type. Right. So it's kind of like, you have no idea what's gonna happen. Okay. You could kill the cell, and then in that case, you'd never recover anything. So it's like, that, that's my point is like, um, when you do CRISPR, there's a series of things that could happen. You don't know what's gonna happen. So you do it, and then you have to strategically figure out actually like what happened to the genome, and you hope it worked. If it's a, if, if so like if you're doing an insertion with GFP, you run the risk that maybe the GFP would mess up that protein. So if it was a if it was a housekeeping gene that was required for life, then the cell might die. You might never be able to recover that. But if it was a gene that was not so important, like it'd probably be fine. If you were doing a mutation, it depends what the mutation did. You might generate a phenotype from that mutation. Does that make sense? Yes. I have a question. Question. So he's targeting a gene that's on a chromosome. Yes. Can you pick which chromosome or is it always both? When you say which chromosome? So like if, if it's like X and Y, or if like the mom has like a faulty. So, okay, so you bring up an interesting question. There's multiple things to that question, which is um, site targeting and ploidy. Let's, right. talk, let's, let's talk about both these things. So the site targeting, like, is very easy in a sense of, yes, that's the benefit of the system. You get to choose exactly where it cuts. That's the whole reason that this system is like amazing is because you get to choose and all you have to do is tweak the guide RNA, that chooses, okay? But you bring up an interesting point about ploid, which is depending on how you're using CRISPR, let's say you're using CRISPR in a, a fly. Flies are two N, they're diploid, just like humans. So let's say you have copy one and copy two. And let's say you have gene X, allele one, and you have gene X, allele two. 
one from mom, one from dad. And you design a CRISPR system to cut gene X, okay? So when you deliver this, it's probably gonna successfully cut one of these, okay? But there's no guarantee that it will cut both. And if it does cut both, the repair will happen on both of these. And there's no guarantee that this one would end up the same as this. So you could generate different alleles based on targeting the same thing. Does that make sense? That's where CRISPR brings a little bit of complexity. So if you were gonna create a knockout, if you're trying to construct a complete knockout of gene X, that creates a problem in that, let's say you might get, you might get one knockout you might get a complete knockout in one chromosome, but my, that knockout might only be heterozygous. You might have a complete full copy of the gene on the other chromosome. So if you're trying to construct something for an experiment where you need a, like, you need a homozygous knockout, that's gonna take a little bit more genetic work to figure out um, if it was complete or not. So let's say, let's say you did this and you produce a heterozygous knockout. How would you, what would you, what data or experiments would you do that would tell you that it's a heterozygous knockout? Like what could you do? Cause this is actually, so, so, so doing CRISPR is one thing, validation of what you actually did is the whole like another thing. Would you have to breed out lines? Breeding would definitely be a part of it, but what would be like the first quick experiment you could do to see this genome, this genotype at the molecular level? Like how would you actually detect that this was the pattern? Could you do fish? You could do fish. Okay, you could do fish. So that's one option. You could do fish. And potentially uh, if it was diploid, then if you did fish on gene X app post CRISPR, you would get a pattern where on one chromosome it was shining up, on the other chromosome it was not. That would be that would be reasonable. Although it's probably not the easiest way. What else could you do? Yes. So lots of people will do after they do CRISPR, they'll do genome sequencing. Although that is also going to be expensive. So that would that would if you did genome sequencing. Um, that's interesting though. If you did genome sequencing, like what would you see? If you did genome sequencing, here's what you'd probably actually see. So you'd have your reads, okay? And if the organism was diploid, there would essentially be, let's say, let's say you were getting um, double, double copies of like every sequence, every sequence within that genome, if it's, if it's 2N. If it was this situation, you would get one region of the genome where like there was only, there was half as much data in that spot. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like there'd be half as many reads in that spot that would indicate that you have a heterozygous mutation. So that's how you would see that in genome sequencing. Um, how else? There's an easier, there's still an easier way like you guys are still not thinking of, that's a key thing about like science is it's also about picking the most strategically simple experiment. What's the most simple experiment that would tell you this genotype exists? You could run a gel. Yes, but before you even did a gel, you'd have to run a- PCR. Yes, okay, and how would you design your primers? Where would you put your forward primer? I would not do gene X as middle. I would put my forward primer right before gene X, and then you could put your reverse primer right after gene X. And so if you had primers like this, how many products would you actually produce? Millions. No. So, so this is not, there's not actually a gap here, right? Cause, because uh, it's been repaired. It's been repaired. So it would be squeezed, it'd be squished together. So you would have, your primer would actually bind here. And in this case, the blue would bind here and the red would bind here. So how many products would you get? If you, one? If you, like it would show up on the gel as 
one thing, right? What if? Okay, so how, again, if you're running this PCR, this, this primer is binding right to this spot, which is right here. This primer is binding right to this spot, which is right here. So how many products should I generate? Two. There's gonna be one that's this, and there's gonna be one that's this. What? Like it would just show up super, super small. Yes. So if you ran a gel on doing this PCR, you would have one product that was the large product, and then if there was a successful deletion, you'd have another product that was lower on the gel. So you'd see this if you had a heterozygous knockout. If you had a homozygous knockout, so you had two copies of this, you would see something that looked like that. If you had no knockout, you would see something that looked like that. So you see how you could very simply use a simple PCR reaction and a gel to determine the actual genotype that was the result of your CRISPR experiment. Does that make sense? Okay. How much time do I have left? Uh, yeah, four minutes. Okay, so let's actually make this even more complex. So this is a pretty easy scenario in the case of a diploid fly. Does anybody work with um, cell culture? Does anybody work with, you have worked with cell culture. Um, what's the ploidy of your cells? Um, do you know? They're SF9 cells. But do you know the ploidy? No, I don't. So when you construct a cell culture, what do you actually do to like build the initial cell culture? So typically you take some tissue, you, yeah. you smash it up, you put it in some media, and all of a sudden you hope that it just like perpetually replicates. What's another type of cell that perpetually replicates? Stem cells. Well, stem cells are like the only one that, yes, so that's true, right. Stem cells do perpetually replicate, but that's a normal case of perpetual replication. Is it, what? Cancer yes. Cancer is the only other case of perpetual replication. It's actually a sickness, it's a disease. So when you're constructing a cell culture, you're creating a cell that is like a disease version of that organism. Okay, and so oftentimes what happens in cell cultures is they become cancerous. And when you become cancerous, what happens to the ploidy? It often gets wacky. So oftentimes cancerous cells, so like HeLa cells, uh, there's a whole book written about like the HeLa cells. HeLa cells are cancerous human cells and their ploidy is crazy. It's something like, I, I don't know, fact check this, but it's something like 18X. Like the ploidy is insane. And so imagine trying to do CRISPR in a cell line where you have 18 copies of the thing you're trying to get rid of. That's a very difficult thing to do, right? So you see that CRISPR can become complex depending on the experimental situation. Okay, um, quickly to wrap this up, let's just talk about some problems problems with CRISPR that are still kind of being figured out. So CRISPR is great in that it's a very uh, great tool because it works in almost anything. It works in many different types of cells. One of the original problems they had to solve was that it did not work in eukaryotic. It did not work in eukaryotic cells. Can anybody guess why it didn't work in eukaryotic cells and what would be the fix? Yes, so CRISPR is a microbial system. Microbes do not have nuclei. So there's nothing in the Cas9 gene that tells it to go into the nucleus. So one of the original big uh, advancements was adapting CRISPR for eukaryotic cell lines. And so to adapt CRISPR to the eukaryotic cell lines, what would you add to the constructs to make it allow it to go into the nucleus? Yes, it's called a, yeah, remember? It's called an NLS, a nuclear localization signal. So they added a N-terminal nuclear localization signal right after the start codon. And that permitted then Cas9 to go into the nucleus. So original problem was that it did not work in eukaryotic cells. The guy who solved this uh, is Feng Zhang at the Broad Institute, or Broad Institute. So he did that. That was kind of like a big thing. Other problems with the system is what's called off-target effects. What's an off-target effect? Something you're not trying to get. 
Yes, so let's say you're gonna genome edit gene X in the Drosophila genome. That means you design your Cas9 guide to match gene X. But Drosophila genome is pretty large. There's lots of sequences. And there's probably other sequences in the genome that have similar base pairs, maybe not exactly, but similar base pairs to this sequence X that you're trying to target. So if there's any other sequences in the genome that this can match with, you're gonna get cuts elsewhere. So every time you run CRISPR, you run the risk of, you might be targeting this, and you might think you have or understand the genotype because you sequenced this region, but somewhere else in the genome, there might be something approximating X that also got cut that you have no idea what it's about. So understanding how genotype translates perfectly to phenotype with CRISPR can be difficult if there's any off-target effects. And guess what? Every time you multiplex, are you increasing or decreasing the off-target effects? Increasing. So every time you add an extra guide, you're increasing the number of off-target effects. So there's bioinformatic ways you can like mitigate this, where like you check your guide RNAs to see if they're binding anywhere else, so you can mitigate this risk, but you never know. So that's why that's why hum editing the human babies. So they've taken CRISPR and they've edited human babies in China. That's why that was quite controversial. That's one reason why it was controversial is because they sequenced the spot where they edited, but the human genome is pretty vast and you don't know what else you messed up or fiddled with in that genome, unless you sequence the entire genome. So there's, a, there's not a guarantee, it's not guaranteed to be perfect. You can get off target effects. Um, so then is the longer the length of the CRISPR RNA, the better, like the more accurate? The length of the guide is a very specified thing. So if you actually get into this and you like study the guides, got, the guides have certain regions, like this region can never change. And then there's a region called the PAM region, and then there's a region that you change. So like there's parts of it that you can change and there's parts that, that do not change. But the sequence that you're looking for, that you, that you do change, I forget the exact length, um, but it's something on the order of like a primer. It's not like thousands or yeah, hundreds. It's really, really small. Yeah, it's like it's like on the order of probably like twenty to fifty. Fact check that. Somebody fact check that. But because it's smaller, there's probably a lot of regions in the genome that that can match with. Okay, so we can wrap it up there. We can end there. That's the basics of CRISPR. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks everybody who came on this rainy Friday.